Thank you for coming this afternoon. Um, I'm going to start with a little introduction to Professor Sims and his work, um, and which is quite impressive because of the various areas in which he has, you know, engaged in his work in the last 30 years. So Professor Sims has been a practicing architect licensed in New York for over 30 years before joining Notre Dame as a faculty member in 2005. But actually, I know that he has worked with Notre Dame before uh, in some capacity, I think. Did you? But 2005 is exactly the same year I came to Notre we were Dame. We both hired at the same time. So the same time. time. So it's amazing that we, we have 14 years that we have been here Going together. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's been author of two books and numerous articles. Uh, Professor Sims is particularly interested in the recovery of the classical language of architecture and its impact that this recovery has on changing approaches to conservation and interpretation of cultural heritage sites. He's authored a very well-known book of his, which is The Future of the Past, A Conservational Ethic for Architecture, Urbanism, and Historic Preservation in 2009. And uh, also another book, which is The Architecture of the Classical Interior in 2004, both published by W.W. W. Norton and, Co and Company. His book on the future of the past has been well received in wider, wide circles, including the Office of Interior Standards, who took some of the verbiage of his work and his book into the report that they gave about new standards to establish in historic preservation. So that was a huge, uh, I think, a huge um, change that happened in the field because of his uh, publication. Professor Sims served as the academic director of the Rome Studies program from 2008 till 2011 and continues to divide his time between Notre Dame campus and the Rome Global Gateway. His research, his current research, is in the area focusing on an English translation of essential writings of Gustavo Giovanoni from publication, uh, which will be published in 2021. His article on Giovanoni will appear in the upcoming issue of Palladio, the Italian journal founded by Giovanoni in 1937. So his own, his, that journal, which he founded, now actually publishes his work in that, in that place, which is great. He's also working with Professor Mazzola and is involved in planning a conference exhibit and a publication about Brazzini to be scheduled for fall 2021 at the Rome Global Gateway in Rome. Um, I welcome Professor uh, Sims with his present talk for a brown back lunch. Thank you so much. Uh, well, it's nice having a small but presumably interested audience. So thank you all for coming. And thank you, Krupali, for that very generous introduction. Um, let's see, I have to go back one. There we go. No, that's, that's it. Oh, do I have to use this? Is that okay? All right. Um, as Kripali mentioned, I've had the great privilege of spending most of the last 12 years living and teaching in Rome. One of the many benefits of this is that I've gotten to know with unusual intimacy a lot of the architecture and urbanism that makes Rome an inexhaustible resource for those who love buildings and cities. But alongside all the familiar landmarks that most people travel to Rome to see and study, I have also made a point of studying the work of 20th century architects whose impact on the city is almost as important as that of previous centuries. So together with the Rome we know, I have come to appreciate another Rome, the product of architects and planners who sought to contribute to the development of the city in continuity with the historical heritage even at a time when the avant-garde was demanding a dramatic rupture with the past and the recreation of architecture and cities in radical new ways. Most of us who studied architecture somewhere else, as I did, uh, were taught about what the revolutionaries did. We learned about Le Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe, Gropius, and the Italian rationalists like Giuseppe Torani, Adalberta Libera, and Ernesto Rogers, whose work we see here on the right. But we learned nothing about all the talented architects who continued to work in traditional ways while also trying to meet the demands of modern life. Names like Marcello Piacentini, whose building is on the left, Gustavo Giovannoni, or Armando Brazzini, who I will be talking about today. Both of these groups of architects were practicing at the same time and vying for public acceptance. 
In the end, the leading architects sought a compromise between classical composition and modern abstraction, a style we now call stripped classicism or modern. But along the way, there were various vigorous classicists like Brasini who would add important and innovative new work to the classical literature before being almost entirely forgotten after the Second World War. This talk is a small part of a larger effort to retrieve the memory of these architects. Their work constitutes another Rome that has only recently become the subject of scholarly study by a new generation of Italian scholars, and as a result, the work and reputation of dozens of forgotten architects from the period between the two world wars is being rehabilitated and newly appreciated. The main reason these architects, like Brazzini, had such a difficult afterlife is political. The complex relationships between the architecture of the 1920s and 30s in Italy and the fascist regime of Benito Mussolini is a subject for a separate discussion. But what I can say after my years of research on these architects has made one thing clear. There was a pluralism of style under the regime as represented by the two buildings on the screen, which were built at the same time. After the war, different stylistic groups were treated differently according to a double standard based on style. Modernist designers like Torani, Libra, Luigi Moretti, Ernesto Rogers, and Pierluigi Nervi were forgiven their collaboration with the regime, but traditionalists like Piacentini, Giovanoni, Cesare Bazzani, and Brasini were condemned for theirs. Brasini himself, in fact, was not political, and he designed projects indiscriminately for the king, the pope, Lenin, and Mussolini. Pretty darn tolerant, wouldn't you say? For the critics after 1945, political opportunism could be forgiven, but opposition to modern movement architecture could not. From the distance of nearly a century, we can now judge these architects' work according to its value rather than in terms of their political alignments, which I see as essentially unrelated to their actual work. I first learned about Brasini from reading Robert Venturi's book, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, as a student in the, at the University of Virginia in the 1970s. This is certainly one of the most important books written in the last half century or so, and I highly recommend it to any students who are not familiar with it already. It's really a very important um, interpretation. In that book, I discovered two names that caught my attention, though I didn't even know how to pronounce them, Le Tarui and Lutchens. The latter caught my attention because he was making buildings that seemed old fashioned in a kind of appealing way, just as the modern movement was sweeping architecture into a radically new way of making buildings and cities. There was another name that struck me as another designer of classical buildings in modern times. Venturi illustrated three projects by Armando Brasini, shown here, that seemed even stranger than Lutchens, and the tiny, grainy black and white photos only added to the mystery. Now, Lutchens soon was acknowledged as a great master, but Brasini seemed to be largely ignored. While my interest in him waxed and waned over the years, I'm proud to say that I eventually managed to publish two articles, virtually the only publications about him in English in recent years, including in the Classicist number 10. But there is still no monograph in English, though there is now hope for one, as I'll mention at the end of this talk. Rosini, like Lutchens, received no formal education in architecture, or for that matter, in anything else. He was the son of a tailor, and was apprenticed as a teenager to become a stucatore, an architectural decorator in plaster. He had an instinctive feeling for Baroque ornament and was soon designing chapels and hotel lobbies as well as realizing them with his own hands. In 1909, he teamed up with a young Marcello Piacentini and they together took first place in a design competition to replace the northern curved end of Piazza Navona. And you saw uh, in a couple slides earlier uh, the actual case, but there was a proposal to redesign the North End, which had been kind of um, broken up over the years. In this audacious but unrealized scheme, seen in Brasini's plaster model on the left, he dared to replace the more vernacular houses already there with a Baroque facade rivaling that of Rinaldi and Borromini at the Pamf Palazzo Pamfili, just 100 meters south uh, in the same piazza. Two arched openings allowed streets to pass through, connecting to the blocks beyond. 
Another early promising work was his executed design for the entrance pavilion at the Rome Zoo, also from 1909, shown on the right. Here he cleverly adds to the reminiscence of a Roman triumphal arch, sculptures of animals, including panthers atop the parapets and the elephant heads at the keystones, whose trunks seem to be exploring the archivolt below. Rosini soon built a reputation as a master of the expressive tour de force. Perhaps the most visible project of Brazzini's in the center of Rome is the headquarters of the National Agency for Preventing Industrial Accidents, or INAIL, as it's called according to its Italian acronym, which was completed in 1931. Um, there's an interesting story. Um, right about the time this building was finished, Mussolini changed his mind about Brazzini. He, before this building, he'd been kind of a supporter, as you'll see later. And as this building was finished, he gave a speech in the Italian Senate in which he said, the National Agency for the Prevention of Industrial Accidents has suffered an industrial accident in its new headquarters. And so he publicly was trashing Brazzini. Poor guy, didn't know what to do. If you stood at the foot of the Via del Corso, facing the Victoria Emanuel Monument and Piazza Venezia, and looked to your left, you saw this building at the end of the street that leads directly to it. The building, rising at the head of Via Quattro Novembre, exhibits all the architect's trademarks. Brasini's main concern was to provide a scenic backdrop visible from Piazza Venezia, the transportation hub and political ceremonial center of the city. The principal west elevation is therefore composed of two distinct but coordinated volumes, each addressing a different scale. The tall and strongly modeled brick mass of the upper part addresses the distant view from the piazza. The avant-corps of the lower volume responds to the closer view from the street approach. The two axes of the two volumes are shifted out of alignment in recognition of these different views and the two parts are given different architectural treatments and materials. While in elevation drawings, this misalignment of these blocks looks disturbing, the building appears unified when viewed in situ due to the shifting perspectives afforded by the constrained urban setting. The design is an essay in three-dimensional scenographic urbanism that is remarkably sensitive to complex existing conditions. It is also beautifully and almost canonically detailed study in confident and uninhibited classicism. The convent of the Buon Pastore, or Good Shepherd, is considered the architect's masterpiece and perhaps is the best known work of Brasini locally. It was originally designed for a religious institution in 1929 and completed in 1943 when it was still on the outskirts of the city. It was later converted into a hospital and currently houses two high schools. Such adaptability to varied functions is especially notable given the work's highly idiosyncratic character, though it also contributed to the building's unfortunate later physical changes and the removal of important decorative elements. Today, much of it is in need of restoration. Surrounded by open countryside when it was first completed, the complex retains the appearance of a little cittadella or walled town rather than a building, comes across in Stephen Harvey's watercolor here. Indeed, in this work, Rosini seems to have unfolded a personal catalog of classical architecture. Accordingly, the exterior has an austere and defensive character, although the plan composition is as disciplined and symmetrical as any Beaux-Arts exercise, the three-dimensional experience opens up a sequence of picturesque vistas, creating a dreamlike and unexpected piling up of idiosyncratic structural and decorative elements at different scales. These nevertheless compose a satisfyingly complex whole unified by the symmetries of the plan. The interior is entirely different. The central chapel with a tall dome that would have delighted Borromini faces a T-shaped courtyard surrounded by extraordinarily airy and delicate arcades. Here, Brasini observes Vitruvian decorum, reserving the most intense articulation of parts and decorative detail for entrances and public spaces and assigning to less exalted areas a more modest expression. Despite occasionally jarring juxtapositions, the masonry walls, monumental orders on pedestals, 
Graceful arcades and figural sculpture are carefully proportioned and scaled and thoughtfully coded to guide the visitor through the complex. It was this multifarious but internally coherent character that attracted the attention of Robert Venturi, who in his book described the building this way, quote, an orgy of inflections of enormous scope. Don't you love that, an orgy of inflections? that astonishingly composes a multitude of diverse parts into a difficult whole. All levels of scale, or at all levels of scale, it is an example of inflections within inflections, successively directed toward different centers. An element of suspense is introduced when you move around the enormous building. You are aware of elements related by inflection to elements already seen or not yet seen, like the unraveling of a symphony. As a fragment in plan and elevation, the asymmetrical composition of each wing is wrought with tensions and implications concerning the symmetrical whole." End quote. Characteristically, Venturi emphasized the asymmetries and inflections, while we can suppose that for the architect, the rigorously unified whole was the more important factor. Design work for the Basilica of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in the Parioli neighborhood began in 1923, and though construction continued into the 1950s, the church remains incomplete. The plan is geometrically disciplined, as you see here, a Greek cross inscribed in a circle with four chapels arrayed on the diagonals forming a St. Andrew's cross, and Brazzini himself described it, quote, as a form both new and yet very classical, the setting of a sumptuous cross in a halo and a sunburst, unquote. While it is tempting to see the church as an exercise in neo-baroque, the designer himself likened his plan to the centralized churches of San Gallo and Michelangelo and admitted a desire to reflect Vitruvius more than Bernini. The exterior, predominantly a brick with a bold Doric order and punctuating elements in travertine, powerfully suggests a Roman ruin. The great buttresses holding up the Colosseum come to mind, or perhaps a late Renaissance church undergoing a slow motion explosion, pressing its massive columns, entablatures, and pediments outward with tremendous force. The structure we see appears disproportionately massive because it was intended as the base for an unexecuted tall drum and dome, rivaling St. Peter's in size. These would have held the composition together with an unqualified vertical emphasis, as we can see in his drawings. To Venturi, quote, the absence of the dome is a circumstance that diminishing its literal historicism transforms the building into a grand and fortuitous fragment like an unfinished symphony, end quote. Venturi notes that the church's incompleteness, quote, emphasizes the rhetorical effect of the buttresses, whose functional uselessness contributes to rendering them more expressive and eloquent, end quote. Venturi's rather romantic interpretation of the project as built irritated Brazzini's son, Luca, who considered this reading a misunderstanding of the architect's intentions. While the 19th century romantics, as well as modernists like Venturi or Louis Kahn, often found poetic inspiration in the ruined state of ancient Rome, for Brazzini, the value of the ruins lay precisely in the opportunity to learn from them and reconstruct them, whether graphically or even physically. A better take on the building comes, I think, from the critic Franco Borsi, who wrote that, quote, Rome is made of walls, of walls often paradoxical, massive, undulating, carved, shaped by the architect as a sculptural material. And in the walls lies the mystery of architecture. All this in Brazzini is not rhetoric, it is instinct, end quote. The spacious interior, inspired by Roman bath complexes, but more sober in decoration, reveals unexpected perspectives in the interstices between the orthogonal nave and the circular ambulatory. But we feel even more keenly here the absence of the visual climax and abundant light that would have been provided by the missing drum and dome. Except for the stately Corinthian order, the intended decorative scheme remains unexecuted in the nave, though we can get some idea of the architect's intentions in the two chapels he did manage to complete. 
even in its truncated state and bereft of its intended decoration, the basilica has a forceful, expressive character typical of Brazzini's mature work. Brazzini was commissioned to design the forestry and agriculture building, one of the planned permanent pavilions of the Esposizione Universale Romana, or EUR, as it is commonly known by its initials, the ill-fated World's Fair that was supposed to open in 1942 to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the fascist state, but was never completed. In contrast to Libera's Palazzo dei Congressi, or the so-called Square Colosseum, which may be familiar to you, Brazzini proposed a rigorously formalized symmetrical building with a Beaux-Arts floor plan rendered in an austere Roman classical manner at a monumental scale. It was uncompromisingly classical, without any of the editing or the strict classical style characteristic of the rest of the buildings at Aeur. The building was never finished after construction ceased in 1941 at the onset of the war. For a long time, the building remained half complete, looking like a ruin. We know the building today only from photographs taken when the building was still partially standing. In the 1960s, the unfinished structure was partially demolished and the remains of the ground floor were incorporated into a modern hotel building. Here you can see how the surviving massive masonry walls, arches, and vaults are visible behind the or beneath the standard curtain wall of the hotel. If you enter the lobby, you'll see some of Brazzini's dramatic masonry arches and vaults incongruously juxtaposed with the modern interior. It is difficult to find documentation on Brazzini's project, and a recent exhibition of the architecture of Eur, uh, held at the Museo of the uh, Arapaches in Rome, made no mention at all of Brazzini or his project. While other incomplete buildings designed for Eur were finished after 1945, Brazzini's was apparently the only permanent building to be abandoned. It was no accident, perhaps, that because it was a masonry classical structure in a context that from the 1950s forward sought to reinvent itself as technologically and stylistically up to date. Aside from his projects for individual buildings, Brazzini pursued his interest in urbanism throughout his career. By 1917, he published a remarkable photo of drawings and photographs of plaster models entitled L'Urbe Massima, which we might translate as the city on steroids, containing designs for urban interventions of extraordinary audacity and imagination. The visionary images of the folio immediately remind us of the fantasies of Piranesi, or perhaps the revolutionary designs of the French designers Ledoux and Boulet. Rosini shares with them a rhetorical grandiloquence, a preference for grand gestures at a colossal scale, and a general lack of interest in the, the needs of contemporary urban life. Some of his large-scale proposals also presuppose an urbanism based on object buildings isolated in enormous open spaces, in contrast to the contextual sensitivity of his realized architectural projects. Also note that these studies were done years before the rise of the fascist regime and had no overt political message. Now, ever since Bernini completed the Piazza San Pietro, numerous proposals have been offered to replace the spina of the med medieval Borgo with an axial approach connecting the piazza with the Castel Sant'Angelo and the Tiber, including one proposal by Bernini himself. All such schemes to some degree removed the surprise of suddenly emerging into the great square from the narrow medieval streetscapes of the Borgo and instead opened an axial vista from the basilica to the river. This arrangement was realized by Marcio, uh, Marcello Piacentini's Via della Conciliazione, planned in 1936 and completed in 1950, which resulted in an uninterrupted and therefore telescoped view of St. Peter's from the Tiber. Instead, Brazzini blocks the axis by a 250 meter long Nuova Spina, a covered passage based on Bernini's colonnades. The pedestrian would gain a view of the square only upon arrival at the monumental loggia at the west end. From there, as in Bernini's own scheme for a freestanding loggia in this location, the observer would have an ideally composed view of the piazza and the basilica. Brazzini's renderings reveal a Baroque vision rivaling Bernini's own. The proposal was also one that could have been built even within the void left by Piacentini's new boulevard. 
but even decades later, Rossini was unable to interest either the state or the Vatican in his proposal. He had only slightly better success with his proposal for a monumental double bridge to carry the ancient Via Flaminia across the Tiber, a project shown in astonishing perspective views featuring great cascades that spill from mid-span and a central fountain. The actual project came to him in 1938 after strenuous lobbying and offering to donate his fees. Brazzini's revised design was officially accepted in 1938 a single span, not the double bridge, without the waterworks, but including a monumental triumphal arch supporting a colossal statue of Mussolini. After the war, with the bridge already under construction, that commemorative element was eliminated and a much simplified but still dignified design was completed in 1951 and still affords a fitting entrance to the city. It's actually one of the most beautiful bridges in Rome. If you know it, it's in the far north part where the Via Flaminia enters the city. After Lourbe Massima, Brasini continued to develop proposals for the Campo Marzio, the largely medieval and Renaissance quarter of Rome in the bend of the Tiber, west of the Via del Corso. And he completed uh, compiled and published these uh, plans in 1927, presenting them personally to Mussolini. These schemes comprehended virtually the entire historic center and revealed, as Brazzini wrote, quote, a new Rome whose urban ensemble would seem modern and archaeological at the same time, end quote. The centerpiece of the plan is a broad new boulevard thoroughfare winding its way through the center called the Via Imperiale, linking the Ponte Flaminio in the north to the Via Appia in the south and providing a grandiose and monumental frame for the principal sites of the ancient imperial and Baroque city. The climax of the new itinerary was to be the Foro Mussolini, an immense open space extending from the Piazza Colonna through the Piazza di Montecitorio to the Senate and then south to the Pantheon. Can you all see that on the screen there? That Here's the Monte Tutorio. Here's the Italian Senate. There's the Pantheon. This is now the piazza with the uh, column of, uh, um, of uh, Marcus Aurelius there. And uh, his idea was to blow away all of the buildings and unify these three piazze. Rossini's plan would have required demolition of historic fabric on a then unprecedented scale. Certainly, preservation in the modern sense was entirely absent from Brosini's thinking, and he considered the loss of post-antique urban fabric a reasonable price to pay for the exhumation of buried antiquities or the creation of more dramatic settings for the more important post-antique monuments. For example, the remains of the Temple of Hadrian, so skillfully woven into the stock exchange in 1874 by Virginio Vispignani, were to be isolated and set up as a freestanding ruin in the vastness of the new foro. At strategic points in this altered fabric, he proposed grandiose new construction, including a Basilica Mussoliniana, as he called it, a new market and commercial center, and a new palace for the Senate, on a scale that perhaps would have made even Hadrian blush. Okay. Those of you who remember the uh, Temple of Hadrian, which is part of another building, uh, will see that his idea was to actually leave it as a freestanding ruin in this vast piazza. Furiously, while the urbanism of the Baroque is recalled in the long vistas linking one monument to another and in the design of the individual set pieces, the Baroque concept of the city as a sequence of formally composed, geometrically ordered outdoor rooms enclosed by continuous facades is largely absent from Brasini's presentation. What strikes the contemporary reader is the cinematic character of his written description, as if he were presenting a screenplay for an epic film set in an imagined Rome of the emperors. Here he describes what sounds like the epic tracking shot at the start of the film. Listen to this. Quote, crossing the Corso Vittorio Emanuele, paralleling the side of the Palazzo Altieri and the Church of the Gesù, the Via Imperiale would be on axis with the Theater of Marcellus, framed on the right by the grandiose pile of the Palazzo Caetani, and on the left by the 18th century Palazzo Cenci Bolognetti by Ferdinando Fuga. Bending to the east, on the right one now sees the harmonious and majestic backdrop of the Campidoglio, 
and ahead on axis, the impressive mass of the Vittoriano. From this point, one enjoys an architectural panorama of striking beauty, whose principal elements are the Vittoriano, with the Capitoline arcs in its triumphal and Roman setting, the Church of the Araceli, the Palazzo di Venezia, the Column and Markets of Trajan, and the churches of Santa Maria Moloretto and Santissimo Nome di Maria. Continuing below the Capitoline arcs, the Via Imperiale is flanked on the left by the forums of Trajan, Augustus, and Caesar, and Nerva and the Forum of Peace in all their superb Roman grandeur, and on the right by the Roman Forum and the glory of the Palatine with all of its monuments. One then descends to the Colosseo, and from there the broad Via di San Giovanni, appropriately widened, reaches the Piazza di San Giovanni in Laterano, and through the Porta Asinaria, flows into the Via Appia, end quote. You know, Rosini didn't have drones. You know, how many of you have watched those videos? You know, actually there was one in the exhibit hall I was watching just a moment ago, New York, San Francisco, Hong Kong, London, you know, these sort of flyover things where you see the city. He's describing that in, what was this, 1927. Uh, so quite interesting, but it's a sort of cinematic idea of this kind of continuous tracking shot through the city. The cinematic connection, however, was no accident. Bozzini had designed the sets for the Italian films Theodora in 1919 and Quo Vadis in 1923. For the latter, the interior sets were constructed to Bozzini's designs, but the exterior locations the film used uh, buildings erected by, by Brazzini for the exposition of Roman art and architecture in the park of the Villa Borghese the same year. An elaborate, if temporary, Roman city, quote unquote, complete with houses, streets, porticos, piazze, triumphal arches, and an imperial palace with a monumental fountain fed by the waters of a lagoon. The Campo Marzo plan seems a direct extension of that scenographic exercise into the real city at a vast scale and with all the contradictions doing so implies. Brazzini's cinematic vision for the urban design of Rome, while it began to take shape years before Mussolini came to power, drew the attention and approval of the Duce, who saw it as a physical correlative of his vision of Romanità. Fortunately for Rome and for us, the vision remained on paper and the Duce, hearing vehement opposition to the plans from his other advisors, suddenly reversed himself in the later 1920s, relegating Brazzini and his ideas to the sidelines. There is that sort of preservation angle, if you will. Every consideration of modern conservation and urban design practice recoils against the destruction Brazzini's schemes entailed. But let us remember that the same taste for new iconic buildings and vast open spaces derived from late Beaux-Arts and academic practice operated also in modernist proposals at the same time, most conspicuously in the Voisin plan for Paris by Le Corbusier, developed at the same time that Brazzini was drawing his designs for Rome. Brazzini's proposals are perhaps closer in spirit to these modernist visions than to the conservationist approach of Gustavo Giovannoni, to whose sometimes lone advocacy we owe the survival of much of what remains of old Rome, and who condemned Brazzini's schemes as megalomaniacal. I knew I was going to stumble over that one, megalomaniacal. Instead of wholesale clearance, Giovannoni proposed diradamento, an incremental thinning out or pruning of urban fabric, which you can see an example of in the right for his plan for the uh, Via dei Coronari. But perhaps it's not the envisaged destruction of historic buildings alone that continues to offend the critics of Brazzini's plans since the modernists were equally cavalier about conserving urban fabric, but the style of buildings that he prepared or that he proposed to replace them was not the real transgression of Brazzini that his architecture was classical rather than rationalist. While Brazzini's urban design proposals for Rome may never be appropriate models for urban conservation, his architectural imagination, visible in both his designs for individual buildings and his interest in integrating ancient monuments with contemporary uses still holds lessons for a sustainable, resilient, and semantically rich built environment premised on continuity rather than contrast between historic and contemporary construction. Ultimately, I think this is what attracted Robert Venturi to his older contemporary, 
although in his own design work, Venturi never took up the tradition that Brazzini represented. We too can take new inspiration from the designs of this exceptional Roman architect today, though we might want to correct Brazzini's excesses while still appreciating his contributions. Whatever you think about his work, it's clear that he deserves to be seen as a protagonist in the history of modern classicism once again. Let me close with a brief update. As I mentioned, Brazzini's reputation today is being rehabilitated, and since the 1990s, Italian historians have taken a more sympathetic look at his work, along with that of his contemporaries that I mentioned. His son Luca's monograph on his father's work has been reprinted, and several books and articles about Brazzini have appeared in recent years offering new critical perspectives. His grandson recently gave the family's collection of his original drawings, papers, photographs, and models to the state archives in Rome, where their preservation is now ensured. These uh, on the screen are two examples of items from that archive. Last year, the University of Notre Dame School of Architecture's Rome program provided a, a classroom space where a conservator performed needed conservation treatments and digitally recorded all these materials before they entered the state archives. We are now making plans for a major exhibition, conference, and publication on Brazzini in Rome in collaboration with some Italian institutions. And I just want to acknowledge uh, working with the uh, Rome Global Gateway academic director, Heather Heidminer, Professor Ettore Mazzola and the RGG and School of Architecture staffs to make this happen, we hope, in the coming years. We also hope the exhibition will travel to the US. The future is looking brighter for the architect's memory that it has in many years, and I look forward to seeing that uh, process continue. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to accept any questions you have or comments. Um, yeah, um, the, the materials that you can see, let's say, the exterior claddings and so on, are traditional Roman materials. Uh, most of the buildings I showed you are constructed of brick with travertine as sort of the decorative elements. Uh, in some cases, the building uh, is faced entirely in travertine, but more commonly, uh, it's a mixture of brick and stone, which is um, basically what you see everywhere in Rome. So it's very much part of that. Um, in other, uh, he did do projects in other cities. He did uh, the city hall for Taranto, uh, a big building also for the municipal authorities in, uh, is it Foggia? I think he did one. Um, and he did a, a, one of the best buildings in Naples that uh, I always point out to the students when I'm there on a field trip on the uh, Via Toledo, he or Via Roma, um, he did the uh, headquarters of the, uh, the, the labor bank of Naples, the Banca del Lavoro. Uh, which is not specifically classical. It's really a, one of his only exercises in the stripped sort of what we call the fascist style, if you will, uh, which is a terrible term, and I tell people not to use it. Uh, so it was interesting that he, he tried to get with the time, and, and that, that building is entirely travertine. It's really a, a white, sort of very abstract, very geometric um, kind of building that you might have seen at Aeor. Uh, which is ironic since his own building at Ayer wasn't that. Uh, but then also I might just add that although his buildings were very traditional looking, quite often they were constructed in ways that were technologically advanced. So for example, the Inayil building that I showed at the beginning and the end, uh, the structural engineer for that building was Guido Zevi, the father of the uh, professor at writer and critic and historian Bruno Zevi. And uh, Zavi uh, designed the whole building with a concrete frame at a time when complete concrete structures were still very much a new thing. And so it was a quite advanced structure and then had this you know, quite interesting material uh, cladding on it. Um, so he, uh, he was not um, by any means a Luddite. He was not close to innovation. He ha uh, in a number of cases, he uh, promoted uh, some of his modernist colleagues for example, he was on the jury that chose Michelucci's design for the Florence train station, which is one of the sort of the leading 
rationalist uh, built projects in Italy at the time and uh, said it was much better than most of the other schemes submitted. Um, so uh, an interesting man. Uh, he had these sort of very sort of hallucinogenic ideas almost, but he also was uh, a functioning uh, professional. He was a member of the Royal Academy. Uh, he was, uh, you know, a, a person of, of importance. He wasn't a kind of uh, kook off in a corner somewhere. Does that help you? Or can I talk more about materials? With I was thinking of the interior of the Church of the Immaculate Mary. Is that the Age of Serena and is the marble real? Or it's kind of in that case, I think because of its incomplete state and because it, he wasn't supervising it in the last stages, uh, as I remember, uh, it, it, as I remember, it wasn't actual marble that it was either scagliola or painted, uh, because most of the interior is just white plaster right now, or painted white, let's say gray. Um, so um, my understanding is that the decoration that he intended was more, uh, uh, let's say, cosmetic in that sense. But there were um, uh, commissioned statuary from a, uh, from a sculptor in stone that was supposed to be installed and wasn't. Um, and there were other commissions from mosaics and paintings and things that never happened. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether it was a purely financial reason or whether there was some other reason. It was the... I think it's the Salesians was the order that commissioned it in the 1920s, and it may be that they weren't able to support the resources needed and what have you. Certainly was ambitious. Any other questions? Yes, David. Was the Kendall Bicycle scheme published? Uh, it, uh, it was privately published, and there are copies of it around. And uh, actually, in about 1980, uh, a whole bunch of drawings for it were exhibited at Columbia University uh, just after I left there. And uh, that was an exhibit that was put together by the Art Museum of Edmonton in Canada. And because all of these drawings were in a private collection, um, and I did uh, get permission to publish some of those uh, original drawings in the article I did for the classicists, so you might check that. Um, if this project goes forward, we'll try to reach that owner and see if we can gain access to those again. Um, I did notice also maybe 10 years ago in Rome, I was walking down the street and there was an art gallery and in the window on an easel was a framed stupendous drawing by Brazzini that they wanted 30,000 euros for. So I guess he's looking up in terms of the market. I don't know who got that drawing. It's, I would have loved to have had it, but I certainly don't have that kind of money to spend on drawing. Other questions? Yes, Kupali. So, um, can you talk about the technical interpretation? It's very helpful to get an insight about how it was received and not what it means for the minister of the Supreme Court. Right. Well, I would say so, yes. Um, the question is, did he really move the tradition of the Baroque forward? And I would say he did, although there's no, no question when you look at his work that it's kind of uh, continuous with the late Baroque of, uh, I mean, there are things in Brazzini that remind you of Guarini, for example. So late Baroque, you know, uh, later 17th century, you know, post Bernini and so on. Did he extend the language? I would say he did because... Uh, one of the things that he introduced was a specifically picturesque composition as a layer on top of the very rigid planning. So as you saw in the, um, let's see, uh, you know, in the plans of the, uh, of the uh, Buon Pastore, that plan is about as, you know, geometrically regular as any Beaux-Arts plan you've ever seen in your life. But the three-dimensional uh, composition of towers and masses, as you can see there, is something, first of all, that you can't imagine that plan from seeing that building, right? You know, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have guessed that that building as it appears would have that kind of plan. So there is this very curious way in which he's sculpturally modeling the volumes while keeping it all within a very rigorous geometrical framework. And also what's interesting is that a lot of the, uh, uh, like in this case, a lot of the fenestration, the composition of the facades is closer to some vernacular sources than it is to, say, the high style. 
And yet, when he decides to make a high style moment, like the main entrance or the chapel or that courtyard, uh, he, uh, I think that this is innovative. I mean, I don't know of another courtyard. I mean, just check out the corners, how he turns the corner. I mean, it's sculpturally so inventive that I think that we can credit him with taking the language and actually moving it forward. I think he has contributed richly to that language. Yeah. Um, and also, what is interesting is to see how he put the mystery in the context as well. Yes. And about maybe not just the building, a building, but maybe in, in, in relation to Canada and Congress. Yes. In relation to that, something that Jim Clark has said. And he termed it as a citadel, you know, a small. A citadella, like a walled town. It's like the building is like a little walled town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that's impressive about him, I'm always impressed by people who can do this, is that, you know, he starts his career as a decorator. I mean, he was making, you know, the sunbursts around the frame of an icon in a chapel, you know, something relatively small in scale, you know, this big, right? And later in life, he's planning these massive complexes or imagining the whole center of Rome in a different way, which shows that he could function at every scale. And um, it's often the case that architects are famous for their mastery at a particular scale. Maybe they're a great architect of houses, or maybe they're a great urbanist, but you know, they, they, they're not as strong maybe designing a small building or vice versa. Uh, it's rare that you see someone whose mastery extends across all scales. And that's something I find really admirable about Brazzini. Oh, the other thing that I wanted to mention that's funny is if you get a copy of Robert Venturi's Complexity and Contradiction, um, the three projects, the Buon Pastore, the, uh, the Basilica of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and the, um, uh, the Aeur building are mentioned in the text with photographs. But every time Venturi mentions Brazzini, he misspells his name. He spells it. And, and it's amazing that in subsequent editions, they didn't correct the error. It's still that way if you buy a new copy of it. He spells it B-R-A-Z-I-N-I, which is funny because, of course, that's the way you pronounce it in Italian. It's Brazzini. But uh, it's just funny that, you know, after, you know, where are the editors when you need them, right? Anything else? Giuseppe, I think that you should build a virtual model of this chapel. <laughs> Have you seen it? Are you familiar with it? I never seen it. I can just I can just imagine your three D model of that courtyard and then going into that chapel and going up into the dome. That would be great. Consider it. You know what we should do? What? Maybe uh, next year. Yeah. We should open a studio. But... Let's do it. I mean, let's have let's have this for the exhibit exhibition. Yeah. Because we're not going to just show Brazzini's drawings. We're going to then have your virtual three D walk through fly through animation, which would be great. Okay, we'll talk. <laughs> all right, thank you all very much for coming.